development of cancer and risk of cancer is an enormously complex uh, idea. So you can't pick one thing out like food and say that you can solve all the problems or you can pin all the blame on one thing. There's lots of things that are out there. So let's just keep that in mind while we go forward. So that's my, that's my uh, idea to keep, keep from getting into trouble. So first of all, here's about uh, four years of uh, an undergraduate program. You've got two seconds to learn it all, and this is what it is. What causes cancer? Well, here's a human being. Here are some of the things that we know that can cause cancer. There are certainly chemicals that are outside our bodies that can cause cancer. The most obvious one is cigarette smoke, right? About 30,000 people a year in Canada alone die because of cigarette smoking. So imagine that. That's three absolutely full jumbo airliners, every seat filled, crashing every day, seven days a week, uh, four weeks a month. 12 months a year and killing everybody on board. So we know that there are chemicals out there that can do you in. There are some viruses and bacteria. Helicobacter in the uh, gastrointestinal system, uh, Gregor knows all about these, can lead to increased risk of developing stomach cancer. There are uh, HPV viruses that can lead to increased risk of gynecological tumors, and the list goes on. We know that radiation can cause cancer as well. Those are the things that are outside. There are some things that are inside. Heredity, how well you chose your parents can decrease or increase your risk of developing cancer. Your diet, and that's, so I left that outside because you have to have diet to survive. What you eat can have a, an effect on your uh, cancer risk. Hormones and age, too. They can all mutate genes. Now, there's one of these that I think is extremely important, so we have to keep this in mind while we talk about risk of cancer from food. And this picture illustrates it. Whoops, this picture illustrates it here. It's a little fuzzy, as Gregor said. The focus is a little bit off. But this shows you exactly what is our major risk in developing cancer. And this is a picture by a fellow named Bittoni who painted this picture in 1746. This is a picture of Time. You can tell that guy is time because he's got an hourglass down here. And he's telling age to destroy beauty over here. So this is age destroying beauty. But age destroys health as well. And it's inevitable that you're going to have a degradation of health with age. So if we think about what the most important thing is here, it's age. The older we get, the greater our risk of developing cancer. And although every one of us in this room would like to live forever, I'm here to tell you the sad news that every one of us is going to die one day. And we're going to die of something. And we can hold that off for as long as possible. We can try to stay as healthy as possible, but we will die of something. And cancer is one of those things, and the risk goes up with age. So the best we can do to put the bright side on things is to try to make sure that we're as healthy for as long as possible. I want to talk about that today, not the inevitable that comes at the end of time. So food and cancer, very complex subject. We've got a typical diet that's got various bioactive food constituents. Those are the things get, that can have an effect on health one way or the other and are not just there to give you calories. They really have an effect on health. There's about 25,000 different ones that we can imagine. They're, so there's a mind-boggling number. Huge variation in the amount of each bioactive substance in any given food. And those bioactive substances that are hanging around both your normal cells and maybe some cells that could be cancer cells in your body as well have a very heavy influence on DNA sequences, which you inherit from your parents, and the function of RNA and protein. Those are the things that DNA makes. And all the cell functions those proteins carry out. So this food can affect cancer risk. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Here's one of the first effects that you can have. David Hill knows about this because he's very interested in things like metabolic syndrome that have to do with diabetes, OK? So metabolic syndrome can be caused, or one of the first things you see is a low birth weight. A low birth weight that shows up can be, can be caused by lots of different things in mothers. Poor nutrition, smoking, alcohol, lifestyle differences that lead to low birth weight in, in infants. So that's one of the first signs of what's called metabolic syndrome or syndrome X. Here's a cat suffering from Syndrome X, sitting here watching TV with a channel changer. The only good thing about this cat is that he's le at least he's drinking a light beer, and I think that's important. <laughs> but 
What actually happens after you have that low birth weight is that if during that period of time, relatively soon after birth, during the few years that the, these kids are growing up, they start to have energy-dense diets, lots of sugars, lots of fats, soft drinks, chocolate bars, fat-rich foods, things like that, particularly at these very specific early growth periods, you'll get these spurts of rapid growth, and that leads to this metabolic syndrome later on in life. And the metabolic syndrome leads to higher risk of hypertension, high blood pressure, and all the pathologies that are associated with that, abdominal obesity, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes. And we're very clear about those things. But not only does it lead to increased risk of those kinds of pathologies, but it also leads to increased risk of cancers of all kinds, breast, cervical, uterine, esophageal cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, kidney cancer, prostate cancer. Lots of cancers that are associated with metabolic syndrome as well. So you see diet here has an effect on cancer down here, not only these other diseases that are traditionally associated with metabolic syndrome. And we need to keep that in mind. Another example, how can diet affect risk of cancer? Women who are undernourished because of famine have a decreased or an increased risk of developing cancer depending upon how that famine actually took place. The example here par excellence is in Holland during the Second World War during the hungry winters of 1944 and 1945. Those were severe famine conditions. It's estimated that about 10,000 Dutchmen and Dutch women died during those winters because of malnutrition and because of lack of food. However, for those that survived, it turns out that for people who had underwent those famines before they were 10 years of age, they had something called breast dysplasia at a lesser rate uh, later on in life than people who did not undergo famine. Now, what's dysplasia? In breast tissues, cells tend to grow in layers, and the layers aren't terribly thick. There's, this is the number of cells in a normal uh, breast tissue. Not, not too many layers of cells here at all. If you get hyperplasia, that's one step on the road to cancer. You get too many cells here. The cells are starting to divide and grow a little too fast. Dysplasia, the cells are no longer well organized. They're kind of jostling each other out of position, and they don't look right at all. That's further down the road to cancer. So this sounds like good news. Undergo famine before you're 10 years of age, you have less breast dysplasia. But after 10 years of age, you get more breast dysplasia. So it turned out that women who underwent famine during those 1944 and 1945 years, adult women and women who are older than 10 years of age, ended up having a greater risk of developing breast cancer later on in life. And the other interesting thing is that it wasn't confined only to the women who underwent the famine. Their daughters also have a significantly different, a higher risk of developing breast cancer too. Somehow, because of the change in diet here, they change the risk of their children in developing cancer. And there's some evidence now that the third generation, grandchildren, also have a greater risk too. So there's something very interesting going on here. How can that happen? Well, I won't go into too much detail here, but this is a chromosome. That's where all the DNA resides inside cells. Unravel that and look at it a little bit more closely. Here you see the DNA ladder. DNA is really a collection of words, and the words are made up of letters, and the letters are DNA bases. Each one of these little ladders is a pair of bases in the DNA. And you've probably all heard about the bases of DNA that encode uh, how our genes actually work. However, you see these little words me, me, and me? Those are called methyl groups. Now, it turns out the pattern of methyl groups that's attached to DNA uh, affects the way that genes act, the way that they function. Methylation patterns are inherited, and here's the kicker. The methyl groups are supplied through diet. So you can modify genes with these me groups, the methyl groups, and you get them from diet. So there's a test afterwards. Everybody who uh, has memorized this and can reproduce it exactly gets a can of chickpeas. So just make sure that you know all this very, very well. Here's all the sources. There's some things that you can use to get um, methyl groups. This contains folate, chickpeas, spinach, citrus fruits, strawberries. They're a great source of folate. Folate comes in here, goes round and round and round, and comes out here. There's the me DNA. 
If you don't have enough folate in your diet, you can impose a heritable pattern of methylation in genes. When you do that, some of the genes in your cells may be expressed at the wrong time during development. And then that, that means that nutritional changes in one generation can change cancer risk in the next because you've changed the pattern of methylation in your own cells because of the kind of diet that you had. That's the reason why changes in diet can lead to changes in risk of cancer for you and also for your children.